Garthi carrying out a preliminary investigation outside the house where the remains of a mother of two were found this afternoon. Boy killer. You know, somebody somewhere has to, has to have seen something. I said to Jim, I think Joe murdered our Rachel. There was no other suspect, only Joe. She confided in us. Yes, I'm in a full-blown relationship with Joe. I love Joe. He talked us through the blood splatters on the wall, on the skirting board, got down on one knee, and basically talked us through how he thought that the murder had been carried out. Notes left in her coffin, including one written by the chief suspect in the case. And we were both thinking exactly the same thing. What in God's name is written in that letter? So we'd have to recover this letter to see what was actually in it. It was now four months since Rachel O'Reilly's death. With a cast iron alibi, the police either needed a new witness or a confession. Could the note in the coffin be the evidence they needed? There was no doubt in any of our minds we'd have to look to have the, the coffin exhumed to recover this letter to see what was actually in it. And that's a decision that's not made lightly because you are, have to inform the family why you're doing it. Now, the Callanese were very, very understanding and they knew exactly what might be there that might be of evidence to us. But it still has to be hard on them, like, you know. Gardy exhumed her body and took away notes that had been left in her coffin, including one written by the chief suspect in the case. These will require special treatment before they can be read. Unfortunately, the, the coffin it had caved in and the girl, the, fr the girl from the forensic team had to climb down and recover these letters, were covered in muck and <sighs> were damp, to say the least. However, Garda technical experts were able to chemically enhance the letter and using infrared technology could now read Joe's final words to his wife. Rachel, I love you so very, very much. I cannot think what I will ever do without you. And I don't want to think. You are the best thing that ever happened to me. And you will never be replaced. This is the hardest letter I've ever had to write. For reasons only we know. Rachel, forgive me. Two words, one sentence. But I will say them forever. The letter that Joe wrote to Rachel was actually it was quite touching, it was quite emotional. So he declared his love towards her. He said that he would miss her. It could be that he's able to compartmentalize what he actually does feel and what he should feel. So he's kind of channeled in all his emotions into this letter, even though he doesn't fully believe them. He also had some fairly cryptic messages about guilt. Whether or not forgive me as a confession to killing her could be that he just feels guilty about the way he treated her, could be about the number of affairs that he had. So to me personally, that doesn't necessarily indicate that he's cryptically trying to admit his guilt. I think most people would be intelligent enough to, to not intentionally incriminate themselves in a letter. The ambiguity was the name of the game on this, so we were all like to think, oh, he was apologising for killing her, but it's too simple, if you know what I mean. He could have been apologising for anything else, so, like, it was. It was one of those letters that was just sitting on the fence, like, you know. Once again, Joe had slipped through their fingers. And the latest twist in the investigation ended up in the hands of the media almost right away. It would be unheard of for someone who had committed such a horrendous crime to make some sort of confession and put it in a casket. But it, 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 this is, is not a normal case, but by any means of description. 
you know, it's just fraught with complexities. That, but that's not to say it won't be solved um, or, or charges won't be pressed. I just don't think it's going to happen in the immediate future. The police were at a loss to pin anything on Joe. I'd say they knew from early doors that it was going to be a, a hard one to crack. Joe had told the Gardai that the morning Rachel was murdered, he was 30 kilometers away at Broadstone Bus Depot with a colleague, Derek Querney. There were inconsistencies in the two men's stories, but it was not enough to charge Joe. So they now turn their attention to the camera on the road. A CCTV camera, half a mile from the crime scene, which they hoped would snare their prime suspect. The CCTV was set up to see trucks going in and out, but it caught a piece of the road. Rachel drove a Renault Scenic. We could see her car coming past the quarry at three minutes past nine, on our way to leave the kids to school and crash. And we could see it going back again at 9.45, approximately. It was going back to our house. Detectives carried on watching to see which other cars had been in the area that morning. Now, we had, at 10 past nine, a car passing up past the quarry towards Lambay View, Joe's house, and the car resembled that of a Fiat Marea estate car, which was the car Joe was driving at the time. And we had that car coming back down again at 9.59. Gardai suspected the car belonged to Joe, but they couldn't read the number plate. Could this be another lead that would go nowhere? A man arrested yesterday and questioned at Drogheda Garda station walked free last night. Gardai now had a lead on Joe Riley, the prime suspect in the murder of his wife, Rachel. A camera on the road had caught what looked like Joe's Fiat Maria on the way to the crime scene, but they couldn't be sure it was his car. So they pulled in footage from all the other CCTV cameras between Dublin and the Knoll to see if it appeared on any of them. We had a guard who I don't want to think how many hours he spent looking at CCTV footage. And then that footage was then sent away to experts in the UK who came over to give their opinion on whether or not that footage was likely, highly likely, very likely, or definitely likely to have been the Fiat Marina. In the end, we came to the conclusion that it possibly was, but couldn't definitely be said it was. Fourteen months after the murder, Joe was still free, and the police needed to eliminate every other Fiat Marea driver from the inquiry. We got the national vehicle file, and believe it or not, there was 2,500 Fiat Marea state cars in the country. So we started going out to the people who had those cars and were asking them, were you in the Nall on such a morning at such a time did you pass Murphy's Quarry? It was a mammoth task. Now, I mean, a mammoth task. I remember coming back from visiting someone in Kells that had a Fiat Maria car, and I came across a scrapyard, and we drove in, and we talked to a man there, and said, we're just making a quiet Fiat Maria. I have two of them, I have two scrapped ones here. And he brought us over, and there was two scrapped cars, Fiat Maria, so we could wipe them off it, but we would never have found them otherwise, like, you know? We weren't able to trace each and every car, but we were able to trace enough cars and enough people to show the likelihood of Joe O'Reilly's car passing the Murphy's quarries at those times, it was his car and no one else's. At the same time, Gardai contacted O2 to ask if they had recordings of the calls that Joe had made the day Rachel was murdered. They didn't, but O2 had something else that might help the police investigation, and it would blow the case wide open. Whenever someone uses their mobile phone, it connects to a cell mast. Each cell mast slightly overlaps with another so that, so that your signal doesn't cut out. Phones use masts to communicate with each other. 
and they brought a professional engineer from France and he was able to tell us what mast was nearest the phone when it was used at a certain time or place. Basically, your mobile phone can track you. You know, it tells people where you were at any moment of any given day. It's a process called triangulation. When a mobile connects to the nearest mast, it sends two numbers, one identifying the SIM card and the other the phone to the network. The more activity on a mobile, the more often it connects to these base stations, which can then be used to triangulate a location. We had all of Joe Riley's data as to what phone calls he made and received that morning. And the funny thing about Joe, and I think he had some sort of knowledge, is that in the period of time that he was out at Baldara or out near Lambe View, he never made a call or a text. But he did receive a call from Derek Querney at 9.25, the colleague who had given him his alibi, and a text from another colleague at 9.52. If Joe had been where he said he was, these would have been routed through the mast nearest to Broadstone bus depot. Instead, they were routed through Murphy's Quarry, the nearest mast to the O'Reilly home. His alibi was that he was in a different place at the time that the murder took place. But the mobile phone data placed him at the scene of the murder. It's very difficult for him to backtrack on that, having accepted that the phone was with him. The guard eye now looked at the other calls Joe had made that morning. He made a phone call to Derry Querney at, I think it was 10.04 or whatever that morning. And then he made a text to Rachel, say, how are you getting on and how are the kids and how oh, heaven's OK and daddy da, I'm the lovely husband type of shite like. He was going through a mast called Richardstown Mask at that time, and that was five miles from his house on the way back in to the city. Down from that, there was a camera on the road. We could put the time of the text message at a particular time and we drove from that mast to this camera and said it was, I don't know, 10 minutes. So we got this camera and looked at the footage 10 minutes after the text was registered. And here we have a Fiat Maria state car passing. And that to us was, that's Joe's car on the way back. Using cell site analysis, which they were able to match up with the CCTV footage, detectives plotted Joe's journey all the way to the knoll and back. So there was no doubt in our mind he was the man out there, no doubt in our mind that was his car that passed Murphy's Quarry. The guard I then checked Eric Querney's phone records, which suggested his alibi was flawed. So 17 months after Rachel's murder, he was brought in for questioning. I remember at one stage he'd been interviewed he jumped up from the interview desk and he went over and got sick in the bin, waste paper bin in the corner. He was under a lot of pressure, like, you know. He did say that I was mistaken, and I now accept that the statement I made, given telling I met Joe at half 10 or 11 o'clock, couldn't be correct. And I didn't see him then. So let's say the plank of Joe's alibi had cracked beneath him. Joe's alibi was the main thing keeping him out of jail. Now it was gone. Today's arrests follow detailed analysis of mobile phone records and CCTV footage. The information the Gardaí gleaned from these contradicts what they were told in statements by individuals, particularly in relation to their whereabouts at the time of the murder. The 33-year-old man was arrested just after 9 o'clock this morning at his workplace in Dublin and brought to Drogheda Garda station, where he was questioned throughout the day about the contradiction. The police finally had enough to take Joe into custody for a second time and quiz him about the inconsistencies in his story. Joe had serious questions to answer. Pat hoped the evidence would convince the director of public prosecutions. There was enough to charge him. We thought we had enough put together the second time in respect to the phone analysis and that. 
and we ran it through the DPP. But the DPP were, I wouldn't say hedging, but they just wanted a little bit more. Shortly before 10 o'clock tonight, the man who's the Gardaí's chief suspect in the killing of Rachel O'Reilly was released without charge. Before he left the station, Joe had a final message for Pat. He was standing down at the end of the corridor and he let a shout down at me and put the thumbs up. How, see you, Pat, good luck. Like, put the thumbs up as if to say, you haven't got me. And away he went. And I remember saying to myself, I tell you, you'll rue the day you done that to me. On the second anniversary of her death, the Kalilis held a remembrance service for Rachel. Although it was held outside the house she once shared with Joe, there was no sign of him or their two young sons. At this stage, I knew he murdered her. It was an unlucky day for her and us that she ever met him. the gift of life to me. And Rose Callaly singing at her daughter's anniversary mass, showing just how strong she has remained since Rachel was murdered two years ago. Oh, I feel that everyone is behind her, definitely, yes, yeah. And hopefully it'll get justice for her, because that's the big thing now. And Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the family didn't have long to wait. When they'd arrested Joe seven months earlier, they'd arrested his girlfriend, whom they'd also had to release without charge. After we released Nikki Pelly from custody, she had confided in a friend of hers that uh, it's very hard to keep lying to the guards when they're questioning you. Nikki told her that Joe said he'd kill Rachel if he could get away with it. So we had more than ample additional evidence that we could bring Nikki in a second time, and we brought her in. And we did put all this to her, and she did admit it, yes. Joe said that, but it was only in past and it wasn't, like, I didn't think much of it, like, it was only talk. Like, I thought just is a little bit more than, you know, uh, given the fact of what happened and that. This time, the DPP agreed with Pat, and he was given the go-ahead to charge Joe 746 days after Rachel's murder. I can't remember where I was when I heard that he had been arrested and charged, but I remember thinking it had taken some time. And there was some incredible footage of the, just the media scrum that was outside those police stations. Yeah. Joe O'Reilly arriving at Swords District Court earlier today. The 35-year-old had been arrested this morning at a house in Dunlear, County Louth, and brought to Balbriggan Gartha Station. Detective Sergeant Pat Murray told the court that at 10.55 a.m. he formally charged Mr O'Reilly with the murder of his wife, Rachel O'Reilly, on October 4th, 2004, at the Knoll in County Dublin. I remember putting my hand on his shoulder, and I told him, Joe, I'm here and I'm arresting you for the murder of Rachel. And he looked at me, and I'd never seen it before, but he turned white. You could see the blood draining from his face. He wasn't expecting it. And he knew I was serious. And the only thing he said to me was, can I put my runners on? And I said, of course you can. He put his runners on. I put the handcuffs on him, brought him out, put him in the car. When he was questioned, uh, he had no comment to make. That was the line he took, and we never spoke another word. That was it. But as the trial began, no one could have predicted the true horror of what would emerge. It was so shocking, the evidence. You know, I found myself looking up um, from taking my notes, like just totally wise mouthed going, am I really hearing this? Eight months after Joe O'Reilly's arrest, the trial Ireland had been waiting for finally started. A 
but no murder weapon had ever been found. And the evidence against Job was circumstantial. Putting him on trial was a risk. Joe O'Reilly arrives at the Central Criminal Court for the start of his trial for murder. He denies the killing of his wife, Rachel, on October 4th, 2004. It's the prosecution's case that while the evidence is almost wholly circumstantial, Mr. O'Reilly did have a motive and an opportunity to murder his wife. Detective Sergeant Pat Murray from Balbriggan Garda Station said Joe O'Reilly had nothing to say when charged. He sat impassively in court as the judge remanded him in custody to Clover Hill Prison in Dublin. 30-year-old Rachel... Laura Ryan, then a court reporter for TV3, is watching her old reports of the trial. I've covered a lot of court cases in my time as a courts correspondent, and this is the one case that always stayed with me. I've never experienced a case that garnered as much public attention as this one at the time. Well, people related to Rachel O'Reilly because she, she could be anybody's best friend, sister. Um, she was just an ordinary mom, two kids. Rachel had just done the school run. She was back at home and, you know, it's the one place where we all feel safe. And she was so brutally murdered and I think it really struck a chord with people. Jenny Friel, a features writer with the Irish Mail on Sunday, was also in court. She had interviewed Joe shortly after Rachel's murder and they had stayed in touch until he stopped talking to the media. When he came in, the whole place just went quiet. He was head and shoulders above everyone else in there, and you just see the entire courtroom just kind of like following him in. I suppose it was it was weird to see him again, but there was still a there was still a confidence about him. He was the Joe I remembered. You know, he was the Joe that liked to be liked. There was no sense that this was a man facing such a horrendous charge. He was just Joe. The case began with opening arguments by both the prosecution and the defense. The lawyers talked about how this was like the strands of a rope all coming together because there were so many different little bits of evidence. But according to the prosecution, all brought together, twisted together to make the irrefutable fact that Joe was guilty. The fact that Rachel's handbag hadn't been taken that had a substantial amount of money in it. So if there were burglars, why didn't they take all this money with them? The fact that he had had an affair that he had initially denied with Nikki Pelly. The fact that there were parts of Derek Kearney's statement that didn't quite add up. You know, that there was no other suspect. And also that, you know, he had a pretty strong motive. But Joe's lawyers argued that the prosecution's case was based on innuendo, suspicion, and allegation, and was wholly circumstantial. Joe pleaded not guilty. The following day, Rose Callally told the hushed court how she discovered her daughter's body. Rose Callally was very concerned when she heard her daughter Rachel hadn't picked up her son from the creche on October 4th, 2004. She drove to her home in the Knoll, North County, Dublin, and discovered the body of her 30-year-old daughter, barefoot, lying on the floor. She emotionally told the court how she knelt beside her, talking to her and rubbing her arms before frantically trying to call the emergency services on her mobile. She said Rachel's husband, Joe O'Reilly, the man accused of her murder, arrived at home shortly afterwards. She said his first words to his wife were, Jesus, Rachel, what did you do? She had to walk up to give her evidence. She had to pass Joe O'Reilly. Like, it's not, it's not a huge space that's between Rose in the witness box and her son-in-law on trial for murder. She spent about 40 minutes or so in the witness box and she was so calm and she was so clear and composed that day. And I remember thinking, wow, how does she have the strength to do this? 
The only time her voice had faltered was when she had to describe what Rachel was wearing that morning. Just leggings and, and a, a jumper, the way so many people do on the school run. As he listened to the evidence against him, Joe kept his head down. He was quite dour, dispassionate, cold even. He never showed any emotion at all, from what I recall during the trial. It was difficult seeing him every day. It was difficult watching him talk with his solicitors and barristers as if he was a barrister and, you know, laughing and smiling and smirking and enjoying his life. The Callalys were convinced Joe had planned to kill Rachel. And they hoped the evidence would be enough to convict him even if that evidence was often painful to hear. Rachel O'Reilly's sister Anne and her brother Anthony were comforted by friends as they listened to the state pathologist's evidence. Joe O'Reilly sat with his head bowed. Professor Mary Cassidy told the court Mrs O'Reilly had eight lacerations to her head. She said they could have been caused by up to nine separate blows. When you're dealing with murder cases, the deceased can't speak for themselves, obviously. And so, as a pathologist, you become the interpreter. The body doesn't lie. Can't tell lies to a pathologist. We know, obviously, from the major injuries that this, is, this person's been struck several times. And from the injuries on, on Rachel, she did try to, to fight off someone. It's quite likely that she saw who was attacking her. It was bad enough that Joe was suspected of killing Rachel, but what made it worse was clearly she would have been conscious of that fact in her last moments. She had injuries towards the top of her head, and that would indicate that she was upright and somebody came in and struck her on the top of the head. It wouldn't necessarily kill you, but it's likely that they could have caused her to collapse to the ground. It's quite likely that once she was on the ground that she got several blows to the, to the head. So there were two splits here. There were another two splits above the ear, behind the ear and back. So there was eight splits on the scalp in total. And the skull was fractured and the brain was bruised as a result of it. There was blood got into her airways and that would have affected her breathing as well. And sometimes an attacker panics because they can still hear the person breathing, and so they go back and rain more blows. That was exactly what Joe had said when he reenacted Rachel's murder, that the killer had heard Rachel's gurgling and gone back to ensure she was dead. We knew then that Joe's reenactments were it were real, um, which was kind of would make you sick. Um, you know, up to then, you know, he's just working off this and that. But when she kind of went through her case, uh, what he what he did, them reenactments were real. Um, oh, I think I think everybody felt that it wasn't really a case of, you know, who, who killed Rachel. It was more or less, would he be caught? Two weeks into the trial, the court heard probably the most damning evidence against Joe. The evidence which proved Joe couldn't have been where he said he was the morning Rachel was murdered. I remember that day, I remember watching that PowerPoint presentation and the pings going off each of the masts. And it showed Joe's phone because he admitted to having that phone with him at all times during that morning. It showed Joe's phone at, say, 9.25, 9.27, 10.13, all those different pings. And it showed that phone traveling from the north side of Dublin City up to the Knoll 
and back again. Why else would Joe's phone be going up to the now, except that it was with Joe as he went to his house, where Rachel was murdered that morning. Two days after that, the court heard further evidence, which proved to be explosive. The jury was given details of an exchange of emails between Joe O'Reilly and his sister Anne on the 9th of June, 2004, four months before Rachel was killed. The emails appeared to follow a visit by Joe and Rachel O'Reilly to a social worker. The court has already heard Rachel was reported to the Northern Area Health Board in an anonymous letter for being heavy-handed with her two sons. The packed court was quiet as the emails were read out. Afterwards, Rachel O'Reilly's mother, Rose Callally, and her sister, Anne, were in tears. Orla O'Donnell, RTE News, the Central Criminal Court. Joe thought he'd deleted the emails he'd sent to his sister, but detectives had been able to retrieve them from his computer. Joe had said that Rachel was the perfect wife and mother and that their marriage was sound. But these emails between Joe and his sister revealed a very different story. Obviously, as a court reporter, you have to take copious, accurate notes. But it was so shocking, the evidence. You know, I found myself looking up um, from taking my notes, like just totally wide-mouthed going, am I really hearing this? There was mention in the emails um, about an overdue birthday night dinner that Rachel had been planning for the two of them. And she had spoken to Anne about it. And, uh, you know, Anne said something flippant, like, oh, I hope I haven't spoiled the surprise. And Joe just, you know, said, you know, Rachel plus me, E plus marriage equals over, that he would never sit down on a date with her again, that he found her repulsive. That's just so final, it's so callous. He's completely emotionally disconnected himself from Rachel, and in his mind, the relationship's over. When I heard the way he spoke about her and, you know, his venom and his hatred of her, Jim and I were just distraught. She would have given her heart for her. And to think he didn't even respect her, much less love her. certainly to his family, he built up a picture of Rachel as being lazy, as being uh, bad with the children, lost her temper a lot, uh, was physical with them. Um, he, he basically was, you know, trying to say that she was an unfit mother. And it, it kind of came out inadvertently that it was Joe's mother who had reported Rachel to social services. And that was also, I remember, greeted at the time with absolute shock. So it, it shows his degree of manipulation that he can make other people think and perceive the situation and their relationships in the same way as he can. So by making her into this evil person, this bad wife, this bad mother, and convincing the rest of the family that she's like that, I wonder if he's doing that because it just made it easier for him to step away. His main concern in those emails was how the meeting with the social welfare officers had made it clear to him that he would be a weekend dad, that he wouldn't get full custody of the children if they did split up. It was an extreme reaction to not being a, a, a weekend dad to, to murder the, the mother of his own two children to accomplish that. When I heard the emails, I think they were probably the most revealing part of the court case. And it kind of showed the level of, the level of 
intense unhappiness that Rachel must have felt in those final months. I mean, it was like she was in a, a pond surrounded by piranhas and she, there was no way out. They just, they kind of, they took her confidence, her motherly instincts, they just, they slowly stripped her. And she didn't realize why. Although all the evidence against Joe seemed overwhelming, there were no guarantees it would be enough to convict him. So the tension, the tension was, was kind of unbearable. Nikki Pelly told the court she met Joe O'Reilly at a function in a pub in January 2004. By April or May, they were having a sexual relationship. Ms. Pelly told the court she and Joe talked about being together permanently in the future. When she was first interviewed by Gordy, she told them it was just an affair. She said Joe told her she should say that. Asked why, she said it was because if she said it was a relationship, it would give him a reason to kill Rachel. It seems that she was 100% in Team Joe. From the evidence that she gave, she was very much his, his right-hand woman and uh, supporting him throughout the whole thing. Text messages that Joe sent to Nikki in the months leading up to the murder were also read out in court. There was one really weird text where he said, um, all your willies are tucked up in bed. Like as if those children were Nicky's. She'd only met them a couple of times. There's no doubt, it seems in Joe's mind, that he's ready to replace Rachel with Nicky. And so that shows a degree of, of immaturity and not really thinking through the consequences of his actions. By the time the trial ended, the court had heard 146 witnesses over four long weeks. But police had never found the murder weapon, nor any DNA that would link Joe to the crime. The family faced an agonizing wait. At that stage, there was no doubt in my mind. It was just a case of whether his peers would find him guilty or not. We were waiting for the jury to come back, and no one knew when they were coming back, so we all went for a pint. We were all sitting there, and I had one big creamy pint of Guinness in front of me, and the next minute, uh, someone came in, the jury are coming back, the jury are coming back, you know? So we all had to we all had to jump up and run back to the to the court. It was a Saturday evening. We'd been there all day. The courtroom stank. Everyone had been eating in it. We thought that we were going to be sent away another day. Um, so the tension the tension was was kind of unbearable. outside echoed some of the most extraordinary scenes ever seen in this court. The jury brought in a unanimous verdict after nine and a half hours of deliberating. The courtroom erupted into loud cheers and applause. The Callaly family jumped to their feet and punched the air. They then burst into tears. When the jury came back with a guilty verdict, I never experienced anything like it in my life. I never probably will. The whole court erupted, just a release of energy, of emotion. It was the most extraordinary reaction I have ever seen, and I have never seen it again. And seasoned court reporters and police and anyone who deals in the courts will tell you this rarely, if ever, happens. But the whole place erupted. I just jumped up. I know I jumped up, and we were so thrilled. Oh, it was like as if the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. My overriding 
memory is of just how horrified uh, Justice Barry White looked and him trying to get control of his courtroom again. The judge was telling people to keep quiet, but he had no impact on the strength of the emotion that people felt and Rose Callaly. people running after us and it was unbelievable cars honking and everything like it it was bizarre it was just sort of surreal do you know when you're witnessing something but there's an unreality about it supporters cheered as joe o'reilly was driven to mount joy jail in a prison van rachel's family watched as their daughter's killer was taken away to begin his life sentence We'd love to thank everybody, the police in particular. They have been so brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And the prosecution team and all the people of Ireland that have been behind us with cards, letters, prayers. It all meant so much to us. And at long last, we've got justice for our darling Rachel.
It has now been 17 years since Rachel was murdered, and life has never been the same for the Kalalis. We miss her every day. Every day you wake up, and I'm telling you this, and it's the God's honest truth, there's not a time in the day where you could say you forget. From the day I found her, there's, you could just put a line down that, that it's nev my life has never been the same. From that day forward, you, you just change as a person, like, you know, and you never go back. You can never get back to the, the sunny side up, you know. You'll have good days and you'll have bad days. Um, but there certainly is more bad days now than good. This is the last video of Rachel at her brother's wedding, singing Spansill Hill, an old folk song about a bereft lover drifting over the land they grew up in, like a ghost. She was such a gift in our life. <laughs> it's so final when someone dies for them. So final, that's the end of it. The only thing I would say is that I loved her dearly. That's it. She was the farmer's daughter, the pride of Spansel. We had her for a very short time, but I wouldn't have traded, and I'd go through all that pain again to have her, even knowing what I know and hard and all as it was. I would do it all again. Many miles from Spencerville.